Elter, Integrated European Long-Term Ecosystem, Critical Zone, and Socioecological Research. So this, this webinar will be on uh, gender, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, it's in celebration of International Women's Day, which is March 8th. So we're a few days early. Um, and the theme this year for International Women's Day is inspire and uh, inspire inclusion. So we hope that this seminar or webinar addresses this. And first, we're going to start with Terry Russello uh, from Elter Central Office to give a brief overview of the things that Elter uh, is doing in terms of gender equality and diversity. And then we'll hand it over to Dr. Rebecca Barnes to give a more broad uh, focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion in ecosystem uh, and environmental sciences. So with that, we'll start with Terry and then move on to Rebecca. Yes. So welcome also on, on my behalf. And if you can still confirm that you see my slides, great. Yeah, you're you're not in presenter mode, Terry. I'm not in the presenter mode. I tried to click that one as well, but okay, now it should be fine. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, yeah. So as Bless said, I am uh, I am working uh, for the Elter, uh, and at the moment at the University of Helsinki, and I have a also a specific role in Elter. I'm nominated as a ombudsperson, so it's also in that my role that I'm I'm presenting these gender and diversity and equity and equality uh, inclusion issues in this webinar. And although ELTRA is a uh, research infrastructure focusing on research, it, it's it's standing on these ethical foundations. And these three three pillars that we can we can distinguish are these diversity and inclusiveness, which of course includes gender equality and where this this webinar is focusing on on today. But in addition of, of this diversity and inclusiveness, there's of, of course research ethics, because that's one of the major topics where where ELTRI is focusing on. And as an environmental research infrastructure, of course the environmental performance is, is quite important for that. And we try to address that when we, we think of, for example, where the meetings are organized and what kind of food is provided and uh, what kind of products we use as, as a giveaways and and such but then more for the for the diversity and inclusiveness of course as a elter is a european research infrastructure uh, our our aims or, or goals regarding this is is supported by what european commission is is saying or kind of also also demanding or encouraging us to do and there there are these three Three main main topics or main main issues: fostering the equality in scientific careers, ensuring gender balance in decision making processes and bodies, and integrating the gender dimension in research and innovation content. And uh, this is these are also covered the so called uh, gender mainstreaming, which means that the this gender perspective should be uh, integrated and included in 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 different ways well, in the, into into all the policies uh, and in different decisions making, saying that that uh, these gender questions uh, or we should consider how different genders or different other groups are affected by different policies and and um, and decisions. And this quote here. You can have access to for the slides later on, so I'm not going to read it. But it's it's coming from the uh, from the elder HRI's uh, gender equality plan. So kind of th that th this issue is 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 important also in the activities of of elder. Uh, more specifically on the elder gender equality objectives. So we aim at having the equity in the gender representations in, in different elder, uh, well, administration bodies and other, other groups. Uh, and this is also according what, what European Commission is aiming at. At the moment, uh, if we look at the project participants, we are about half half, but then still on the more top level looking at the at the work package leads or task leads, uh, uh, it is not as equal as it is. But one uh, important um, 
consideration or improvement to this has been that Elter tries to hold this kind of double double chairing, so that there would be always two persons or double yeah two persons um, responsible of a certain position or kind of supporting each other, and they would represent uh, different genders. So this is one way of of encouraging this representation. Um, then this engaging in gender mainstreaming throughout the elder managerial decisions and policies, I will I will have on one of the next slides a list of uh, different strategies where this has been addressed or where there's plan to address this. And then, uh, of course, this um, increasing awareness and, and inspiring rate and tolerance, inclusiveness and respect is one of the important aspects where this uh, this seminar is also aiming at. Uh, and of course, as the as the box in the lower part of the slide is saying, it's not only gender diversity, but but we we kind of want to address also other uh, other um, aspects where equality can be uh, increased. And I just wanted, I don't want to show the, the bigger pictures of ELTER, but, but kind of because this is a Sites and Platforms coordinators or Sites and Platforms forums uh, webinar, I wanted to have this uh, short overview of, of how does uh, the picture of them look like. So here you see all the the, the green dots on this on the map are the ELTER sites and ELTER platforms across the Europe. So about uh, 620 sites and looking at the sites and platform coordinators you have the uh, this figure shows how how the different genders are presented in the in the, that level uh, then if we look we had last fall uh, first uh, physical meeting with the sites and platform coordinators. This is how the participants were divided. And then I shortly look at the, the registration for, for this webinar, how the genders are, are divided. And of course, this is mainly based on my interpretations of people gender uh, based on their names. So this is not reflecting how people feel, but but this kind of really by um, binary approach, which was simply to apply here. Um, then uh, just a little bit of more, a couple of more details of how ELTER is, is, is engaging in uh, mainstreaming is this um, uh, and how the, the gender equality plan is applied uh, are these administrative steps. So there will be these public statements setting the public example uh, of, of uh, promoting science done by, by women and, and such. And then this um, ombudsperson is also mentioned, mentioned here. Uh, of course, this setting an example, and now we are three women pr talking in this webinar is maybe not the optimal optimal uh, way of doing it. Uh, but I can maybe mention Daniel Orenstein from Technion University from Israel has been uh, very much involved in, in bit, uh, writing the gender equality plan, but he was involved in the previous uh, sites and platforms webinar, so we wouldn't, didn't want to give him too much work to be done. So then you have three of us here today. Uh, then there are these integrated policy measures. So this is related to the yeah, mainstreaming, just listing shortly the, the different strategies or papers where, where this is addressed. And then uh, the last point is, is this, uh, raising awareness issues. So there has been uh, several online events already. And also uh, within different meetings that we have been having in Elter, we have had uh, uh, sessions uh, to address address the gender equality and diversity in general. So uh, this is something that we try to include in in the agendas of of Elter activities. And then, of course, um, at least we have had one more specific training to to address these these issues and more more will be coming. And then I still wanted to list uh, before handing over for Rebecca, a couple of other diversity aspects that are of course present in in the world that we are working uh, with. And, and in the scientific world, age is of course one aspect that 
um, can affect how how your voice is heard or how do you feel in different situations. And and in Elter, we have this group called Early Career and Friends uh, who tries to make sure that uh, that the opportunities are, are built up also for the for the well younger scientific uh, career state people and also to have their representations for example for planning the uh, upcoming elter science conference then of course language is one issue we are in europe so most of us are using english for shared language although it's not our native language um and uh yeah, we have been discussing, like, for example, the newsletter that Elter is making is now in English, but there, there might be an opportunity to translate it to your local language and then share with it your communities to make it accessible for for wider audience. Um, and then we, if we look at the uh, sites and platform coordinators as a group, it's a diverse group, so there's a big diversity in it here. On the pictures, uh, you see the like personas kind of archetypes of of what kind of roles an SP site and platform coordinator can have, and and the aim is that we could uh, or, or the activities that we are we are organizing could address these different roles that uh, sites and platform coordinators can have. And uh, well, Europe is also like geographically wise. So one way of addressing is is kind of uh, varying uh, the location of meetings. Of course, as I said, it's also quite strongly linked to the environmental footprint of organizing a meeting, but also not to force every like someone to travel all the time very far away is one of the, the aims here to make things a bit more equal. And then, of course, we are coming from different cultures, also religions affecting how how uh, timing of the working week is is addressed. And uh, although we we are mainly following this from Monday till Friday, but at least we are aware, aware that it's not the case, the easiest case for everybody. And this has been openly discussed uh, with people from Israel, for example. And uh, well, my talk was more mainly now focused on the activities that we do within Elter, and uh, then uh, I'm I'm sure that Rebecca will give a little bit more wider perspective how these are these are seen in in the scientific world in in general. Great, thanks, Terry, for your talk, and why Rebecca, why your Setting up your screen, I can just say a few words. First, we're really happy uh, that you're joining us all the way from the US. Um, so Rebecca currently is a AAAS uh, Science Technology Policy Fellow working with the US National Science Foundation and the Belmont Forum. Um, and she has for several years, uh, maybe even more than that, have been working around these topics. And we're really glad that you're here to share some insight with us today. So with that, welcome. Thanks for that introduction. And Terry, thanks so much for that great overview of all the things that you all are already doing and sort of the different axes of diversity that you're starting to think about beyond gender, right? And and also recognizing that gender is not a binary, even though most of our data is unfortunately collected in that way. Um, even in preparing this talk with these two amazing individuals, we were talking about just the norms of Zoom. For example, in the United States, we now have a norm in the diversity, equity, and inclusion community of putting our her pronouns after our name, which is why after my name, it says she, her. In discussing this with Blaze and Terry, we I then discovered that in different European languages, pronouns, there are pronouns that are genderless. There are pronouns that have um, different meanings. And so all of these things do not translate. So I think it's really... <laughs> no pun intended. So I think it's really important for us to remember and give each other grace that everyone's doing their best, right? And if 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 any point we're offended or like rubbed the wrong way, like let's assume good intentions when appropriate 
and try to educate each other, right? But we need to come to these sorts of spaces in order to do that. And while Terry was very um, honest about her methodology of determining the gender participation in this meeting, um, my guess is she's not that far off. And right, so, and two of the folks that identify as men are people who have already seen me give this talk um, earlier in January. Thank you for coming back. Um, and are the reason that I am here. So I think that it is important to recognize that potentially the people who need to be in this room are not in this room, but that doesn't mean that we can't make progress as a group of like-minded individuals together. So um, if at any point I speak too quickly, because I am prone to do that, Blaze or Terry, just like wave your hands frantically and I'll hopefully see you. So let's see if I can advance. So why are we here? So this is something that I took from uh, the Spanish National Research Council. So uh, the coordinators of this uh, lecture series sent me a bunch of resources um, from the European space so that I could try to provide you things that are more appropriate than my resource knowledge, which is admittedly more US centric. So this is just about research integrity and why in this case, they're talking about the need for a code of conduct. And so research integrity, good scientific practices, they're based on this list of values. And my guess is that all of these things are things that every single scientist would say, check, 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 right? Everyone would agree. But what does impartiality really mean? I mean, that's kind of challenging. And independence, do we mean independence statistically? Do we mean independence from our advisor that we learned from? What does independence mean? Um, respect, that's a great word, but it means a lot of different things to different people in different cultures. And if we go back to the mission of this amazing network, I cannot believe there's so many sites, it's, it's mind boggling, um, right? The mission includes statements like responding to the challenges of understanding the complex interactions between people and nature over the long term. Um, you do this in order to identify and mitigate human impacts on ecosystems through the state of the art research infrastructure, collaborating working culture and transdisciplinary expertise, which means you're inherently uh, acknowledging that stakeholders and societal actors have interest in the work that you are doing. And it's the reason behind what you're working on. In fact, you even have a whole series of um, sites that are socio-ecological sites that very specifically are studying the integration of um, human nature systems and acknowledging this commitment to stakeholders. So reading this, I was like, you scientists, you are my people. I am trained as a watershed biogeochemist. You are obviously, I am talking to the people who are trained in a very similar way to me, but right, I'm already making assumptions. I'm just gonna call myself out on that. So um, I want to acknowledge that many of us in this space um, it, understand what biogeochemistry is because it's this interaction of the biosphere the geo, and the geosphere as well as the atmosphere. And the Ukrainian scientist who was one of the founders of biogeochemistry really envisioned the earth as three spheres, the abiotic sphere, the biosphere, and noesis. I had to look up what noesis meant. So noesis is the sphere of human cognitive processes. I was like, oh, I don't study that. I'm a biogeochemist. I've been since I could define what type of scientist I am. Um, this is the biogeochemistry I study and looking at through some of the amazing research that your sites are doing, this is also the biogeochemistry that many of you are studying. You may call it something else, critical zone work, uh, atmospheric science, but many of us are really, dare I say, slightly obsessed, but really interested in understanding how humans are changing the carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur cycles among other global cycles, and then the implications of these changes on our ecosystem. So the reason I'm here is I was at a Biogeomon event, which was uh, started in response to the ecological ramifications of acid rain, right? And what we now call atmospheric deposition, right? And so, right, 
many of the sciences that uh, bring us here are because of human interest and human interest in the ecosystem. However, we don't often think about the humans in this equation. And so what I want you to think about now is that you're an individual, right? And you were trained as a scientist. And my guess is that many of you use the term mental models or, um, you know, back of the envelope calculation, anything that's like an approximation. And you use it often to explain to your colleagues or your students what's going on, right? It could be a mental model of the system you're studying, um, a mental model of a new uh, grant you're writing, like how you think all the pieces are gonna work together. When we make these mental models, we need to acknowledge that they're underlain by our own uh, expectations, experience, and beliefs, right? And these things are going to be different for each one of us because each one of these things are underlain by our assumptions, right? And many of us, the problem with assumptions is that many of us don't even know we're making them. So in an effort to just like get a sense of who's here, um, and because I was unable to get the annotate tool to work, we're gonna try a different approach. So if everyone can go to the chat space on the, you know, in the Zoom button and write down the country that you were joining us from. And before you hit return, like you don't hit return until I say go, but then I'll say one, two, three, go. And then we'll see all of the locations represented. Does that make sense? At least for my two co-conspirators, it does. Okay. So um, does everyone, I'm going to see if I can see anyone else nodding. No, they've all wisely turned off their cameras because they recognize I'm going to ask them to participate. Okay, so uh, I'm going to assume that you have written in your country of where you're joining us from. So now you can hit return. Right, so we have folks from the US, Finland, Sweden, uh, Germany, Poland, Belgium, Czech uh, uh, Chechnya, uh, Finland, Germany, Bulgaria, Slovakia, right? Whole bunch of languages, cultures, and religions likely captured in that information, right? But I don't know any of it, right? All I asked was where you're joining us from. You could be on vacation, right? So, right? So, and you might have actually answered it based on where you were born, right? Wasn't a very well phrased question. And the results, we need to then interpret them as best we can. Okay, maybe this will be a little bit more straightforward. Uh, we are going to do this again, but with discipline. And admittedly, I don't, I recognize I did not list every discipline that could possibly be uh, represented in the European long term ecological research sites, but I tried to do my best. So we're going to do the same exercise again. Um, but with your discipline, feel free to be as specific as you would like. Okay, so in uh, I'm going to count down from five in case you all need a little bit more time to type. So five, four, three, two, one, hit return. Oh, it's so fun watching all the chats come in, right? So, right, so we have all of these different spaces, ecology, sociology, botany, biogeochemistry, landscape ecology, limnology, oh, the class that made me love water, hydrology, the class that made me think, oh, water has math in it, um, vegetation ecology, right? So all of these are different disciplines, right? And um, tropical forest and ecology, right? So even more specific, right? These are all different disciplines. And my guess is you can then sort of start deciphering it and be like, oh, well, in college or at university, I was a blah, blah, blah major. And then I discovered this and became a this major, right? So even our backgrounds really go into this idea of um, what our mental model is, right? Because our experience and our expectations are incredibly dependent on how we were trained. I'm trained as a geochemist. That means when people say energy, I think about thermodynamics. I've learned that some of the ecologists in my life, when they hear energy, they think carbon. 
this was new to me, right? And they, I mean, I can see how it would happen, right? But this is a very simple misunderstanding or a different use of language that I'm guessing most of us in this Zoom space can recognize both truths are real. But there could be an impasse if we were trying to work together. And every time they said energy, I thought, uh, you know, Gibbs free energy. Um, and they thought um, carbon molecules, right? So I think it's important to have these really, um, to just acknowledge that we're different, um, you know, and that does not, that is not a bad thing. It's actually a strength of the long-term ecological research station uh, network. Um, and quite frankly, the reason they were formed to bring scientists together from different disciplines, because we recognized we none of us individually or individually within our fields as hydrologists or geochemists could answer these really global questions. So many of you don't know me. And, you know, for those of you who can see me um, or can't see me, I am a white blonde woman with glasses. So if you correctly ascertained that, you are correct. If you do not follow me on social media, my guess is you do not know the following, but all of these things are true and they are all part of the experience I bring into my every single day and the reasons I do work. I am a queer woman who is, a neuro who is neurodiverse. I am a survivor of assault and I got bullied out of my job in academia. And I'm also an incredibly good scientist. And of all of those statements I made, I don't know if any of them made you uncomfortable, but the one that made me the most uncomfortable to say is the fact that I'm a good scientist. And I have a CV to prove it. And I still question it on a daily basis. So I want you to recognize that we bring all of that to what we do. And I was gonna do this exercise with like ridiculous faces and sad faces and just remind you all, right? That, you know, we have emotions and these people who say, don't bring emotions to work, clearly missed the COVID-19 pandemic, right? Um, where we all worked from home, so we couldn't leave them at home. And also, right, giving your most every day isn't giving 100%, it's giving what you can to the environment you're in. And some days that's a lot less. Maybe in my case, my cat decided to throw up at 3 a.m. I don't know if you all have cats and know what that sound is, but it is alarming and it sounds like their insides are coming out. So if I seem a little distracted, it's because I didn't sleep very well, right? But like, I don't typically include that in presentations, right? So, and I'm not asking you to give me grace, but recognize that like even those little things change how someone reacts to you in a meeting, right? And it's just important to remember that reactions are generally 90% about the person who's reacting. So to get on to the point of why we're here, I really want you though to keep that context in mind as we walk through these slides and I present data that is both US and European driven, um, though admittedly more US driven, and I uh, found some reports comparing the two. But I just, as like oh, ideas, because whether you think they're true at your site or not is sort of irrelevant. They are true at some sites. And we need to make sure that these things um, we're working to overcome these biases. It's hard. A lot of these things are just ingrained within us. They're not our fault. So um, this is a picture from Hubbard Brook. Hubbard Brook is our sort of grandfather of long-term ecological research sites in the US. It was our first uh, LTER site. And this is actually from anonymous participants um, at their site. So new lines and ideas of inquiry um, have to be approved by elder scientists before it can be given merit. And only older scientists are seen as experts. Right. This is something that is very prevalent in the sciences due to our hierarchical nature and probably the reason behind some of the early career efforts that Terry was speaking about uh, before. Uh, this is a great quote that um, from Colleen Iverson. Uh, by the way, all of the citations I are that are in my talk will get emailed to you if you registered um, and as well as the resources that I am providing. 
So Colleen um, is in charge of the big Arctic program for the U.S. Department of Energy's uh, work. Uh, and this is a very interdisciplinary space. And you all are already familiar with the interdisciplinary spaces, given the nature of your work. But she acknowledges that as we become part of larger teams, as we move away from just hydrology and start talking to the people who think about what's in the water, um, talk uh, thinking about the people the, the people who study the plants, we need to think about the fact that we have to become leaders in creating cultures of safety, inclusion, and trust. Because as it turns out, our disciplines are only the quote unquote tip of the iceberg about what makes us different and how we can contribute to you know, advancing knowledge. So um, just some statistics. Women, and this is again defined in a binary way, um, made up 11% of the top publishing authors in 13 leading ecology journals. So this is a study that was done from um, basically 1950 to 2020. Um, a paper that I have that's in revision right now, I went through all of the biogeochemistry articles in Global Change, uh, sorry, Global change, uh, biological changes, and the JGR Biogeosciences Journal. So this is over six thousand manuscripts, and seventy-seven percent of these authors identify as white, and thirty-one percent of these manuscripts had no women or no non-binary authors um, in the author list. I did think, oh, maybe there are hordes of articles being written by all women and non-binary author teams. But unfortunately, that is not the case. Only 3% of these over 6,000 manuscripts uh, were written by, um, uh, authored rather, I should say, authored by people that all identify as women. We can also look at the reviewing step, which is critical to the scientific enterprise. And when we look at the reviewers for these 6,000 manuscripts, so now we're talking about close to 27,000 people from all over the world, 85% of those reviewers identified as white and 64% of them identified as men. This really speaks to who we think of when we think of what a scientist is, right? We're asking, even the women who are submitting articles are asking for men to review their work. Um, this is uh, data from a project that I've been involved in looking at earth and environmental and space sciences globally. So this has, uh, we have approximately 30 400 people in this survey. And we found that between one third and 40% of these scientists, which I'm shortening to geoscientists, have experienced insulting remarks, devaluation of their work or bullying in the last year. So this year was the year before COVID-19 uh, shut us down in various levels around the world. In the same survey, our participants uh, revealed that close to 50% of Folks who identified as Black women or non-binary white respondents had considered leaving the geosciences in the previous year, given their behavior, uh, the, the behavior of others towards them. Uh, this number was above 33% for all categories except for uh, folks who identified as Asian men who are straight as well as folks who identified as white straight men. So every single other category of intersectional identity that we could identify, respondents reported greater than 30% of them said they considered leaving their job or their fields because of how they are treated. In my opinion, if that number is above zero, that is a problem, right? But I recognize that might not be a reasonable goal, right? But 30 to 40% is really completely unacceptable. Um, and we see that this work is really being taken up across fields. So this is a US-based survey, so apologies there, but it is across um, multiple fields, including humanities and social sciences, as well as the natural sciences. And they found that women were more likely than men to feel pushed from their jobs as opposed to being pulled towards better opportunities. And this difference actually extended and increased after job security was obtained. So in the United States, after tenure was obtained, this gender gap actually got bigger. 
And so this is a study I found um, by the Society of Women Engineers, and this is comparing, they have lots of great graphs, I just took one, um, comparing the experiences of folks who identify as women engineers in the US and Europe. And you can see that there's actually quite a bit of difference in terms of what companies are supplying uh, or providing their employees and what folks' impression is about how, in this case, binary gender, how different genders are perceiving uh, these issues in the workplace. Um, a graph I didn't include, this is included in the resources, was something that while in most cases, Europe seems to have a slightly better um, sense of gender equity within the workplaces, looking throughout the graphs, the US has a lot more resources provided to their employees, which may be because there is this perceived lack of equity. But what was very clear from the report is that women in the European nations were saying, oh, if it's there, we use it, right? So, and many, many studies, I recognize that most of the work in Europe has been done around gender. And then because of your GDPR requirements, it makes it really challenging to actually get at some of these other um, diversity measures. But um, study after study has shown that where women or folks who identify as women feel comfortable, it is more likely that people from other underrepresented and historically excluded groups will also feel more comfortable. That doesn't mean that we don't need different measures, but it is a good sign of um, parallel efforts. So to move beyond gender, um, I wanted to give you some more data. So this is again from that global study. We have geoscientists who identify as disabled or having a disability are experiencing more negative workplaces. And I think it's important, right? We go to the same job or the same workplace, but we experience things differently, right? And this is really important to remember when someone shares something with you, validate what they're sharing. Just because you haven't experienced it doesn't mean they didn't experience it. And as someone who was bullied, Admittedly, that gaslighting, that denial of my reality was as harmful, if not more harmful than the initial act that I was subjected to. So I just want you to remember that we all have different realities. Um, some barriers are invisible. So field work is important, but we must recognize the manifest risk it poses to LGBTQ plus people. So this is a quote from Chris Jackson, who's now at Jacobs Engineering. He was at the University of Manchester, and it was in an article in the Geoscientist in 2021, talking specifically about European geoscience programs and their field camps and their field work going to places where LGBT individuals are given no human rights, right? And as it turns out, um, Chris and I agree with him, uh, there is no reason we need to study rocks in a country or plants in a country where some of our students do not have the inalienable right to exist. Um, geoscientists who identify as LG, uh, sorry, LGBTQP plus experience more negative workplaces. So again, right, uh, more devaluation of their work, more fear for their physical safety and more bullying and intimidation. One thing that was brought up earlier, right, is the cost of being a non-native English speaker, right? I work with a team of all non-native English speakers. I'm the only one and, oh, that's not true. Nicole Arbor, also the executive director. And I, I remember reading this article also provided in the resources and looking at the graphs that estimate the amount of extra time it takes to communicate science if you are a non-native English speaker, quite frankly, being forced to work in English because that is the language of science. Um, only 5% of the Earth's inhabitants speak English, human inhabitants, sorry, uh, speak English, right? Yet we make statements, I've heard statements such as only the good science or good scientists all speak English. It's just not true. There's plenty of scientists who do not speak English and they can, are very great scientists. And so this study actually calculated the, the amount of extra time it takes for uh, the task that those of us who speak English as our first language or are incredibly proficient in it might have forgotten um, how long it could take. And they've also done it. So it's for different countries as well. So they have different incomes and different 
uh, native languages. So you can see that income um, matters as well as proficiency. Um, but what this is struggling with communicating research in English. And so you see that almost everyone is struggling some of the time, regardless of which category they're in. And from some other graphs, I um, pulled some numbers. So these are non-native English speakers who have already published 10 English papers with them as first author. They reported 15 to 40 extra minutes to read a paper five to 12 extra days to write a first draft. And 80 to 95% of them are having their writing checked by someone else versus 30 to 50% of us who have English as our native language. And so, so at the Belmont Forum, we're introducing a um, multilingual platform for accepting research proposals. It will have AI embedded within it. Um, we're trying this. We don't know if it will work, but we're hoping that this will increase access to the research enterprise, right, by providing folks um, a platform that will be in Spanish, Portuguese, and French in addition to English. So I just want to remind you, and I think this quote does a good job, that the function of racism is truly just to distract us. Right. Every time we are distracted by these microaggressions or these other things, we are taking away time from our work. Right. So this quote from Toni Morrison, I think, is so great. It says it keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. None of this is necessary. There will always be one more thing. So we know that, in fact, the leaky pipeline analogy is just not that great because this analogy implies that loss is passive. And as I've just gone through, I we have, and as you all, I'm sure are very well aware, there are mounds and mounds of data that show that if we are going to equate a person to these water drops, these water drops are more likely of a certain gender or of a certain race um, than they are of another, right? So loss is not passive. Rather, right, this is not a supply problem, right? So a lot of our efforts have been around recruitment, right? Let's get girls in STEM. Let's get people excited, right? As it turns out, children are excited regardless of background about learning science, right? It's society that tells them who and who should not do this as their job. And unfortunately, our structures, even the LTR system, reflects that society. So we really need to think about it as a hostile obstacle course, right? And think about the fact that while, you know, in this example, a white man versus a woman of color, right? They have the same starting point, same end point, but this woman of color has a lot more obstacles to overcome to get to the same point as that white man on average, statistically speaking, right? And this has to do with who gets invited to speak, who gets invited to review a paper, who gets access to the long-term ecological research station, right? That's why some of the data that I know you have showing that your participants are actually pretty close to gender equal, right? Uh, but leadership is about 20% uh, women identifying scientists as opposed to 40 to 60% uh, women identifying scientists, right? We need to get folks in those leadership positions, um, but often uh, they are held back for a variety of reasons that are often not specific to them, but rather specific to society. So this is so prevalent in our space because of the master apprentice model, right? This is how we were trained. You know, I will always be connected to my PhD advisor. I still go to him um, for help on certain things, right? Um, and that's because I have a really great relationship with my PhD advisor. Everyone doesn't have that. And I know that my friends who didn't have that, right, people are like, well, why is your PhD advisor not writing you a letter of recommendation? You know, just that one relationship and that lack of letter and that perception, right, can cause problems. We have and live in an archaic gender and racialized hierarchy. It's just the reality. Um, we, at least in the United States, and I think this is true in, the, uh, in Europe, we still really celebrate the researcher who brings in the big dollars, who brings in the flashy study that's on the cover of science or nature. 
Um, if we're honest, right, uh, Western science is built on a system of colonial power, right? So if you look up old images of scientists, they're all white men, right? All of European descent, um, right? And we have a lot of exclusionary practices in our field work. Simple things like, do your first aid kits have feminine hygiene products in them? Yes or no, right? Do your um, field stations have a first aid kit that everyone knows where it is? Does every person who goes to your field station know who to report a problem to, right? These are all things that we often think, oh, it's not a big deal, right? Until something happens, right? And so we need to think about it and think about how we can make these spaces more inclusive. So this is a quote from Vernon Morris. He's a professor at Arizona State. Ideological changes are required within the geosciences. Again, this is a shorthand for sort of all the sciences that study the earth to remove racialized barriers and the psychological violence that prevents access and opportunities for full participation of black, indigenous and people of color in the academy and other careers. And I just think that this is an important acknowledgement. Right. And we need to to get to the title. Right. Reimagine our scientific enterprise. Right. We need to interrogate our history. Right. And think about what we do on a regular basis and whether or not that might make others feel excluded. Um, we need to redesign our science education so it doesn't require ableist activities. We need to prioritize the safety of people. Um, we need to value the labor of care. And we, in my opinion, really need to redefine scientific success. So I don't want this to be all doom and gloom, and I recognize we're coming close to the hour, um, but I want to present some things that we can do as individuals. And here is just a quick list. Um, these are stickers that I made. Um, and I point out that even doing something like making a sticker to honor a colleague that you lost who really cared about these things, and I was, I'm raising money um, for a scholarship in his name, right, to support early career researchers from historically marginalized communities, right? We can, and I'm doing it on social media. We can all do little things, right? We can all check our biases. We can respond to emails from students in a timely manner. We can lead by example. We can treat others with respect, you know, these things are fairly obvious, but I think importantly, we need to speak out when we see things that are wrong. Unfortunately, it's really hard to do those things, right? So we need to be able to educate ourselves of all of the resources that Blaze sent me, and she sent me many, and there was many great ones. This is the one that if I was going to choose one, you should all go read. So this just came out, right, hot off the presses, um, and it is a practical guide to supporting diversity in research environments um, in uh, across the European uh, space. And uh, it has, it's mostly about gender, but it also acknowledges some of these other axes that I've discussed. Um, all of you work at, uh, as part of these long-term ecological uh, sites, right? And so, um, these are some organizations that have created uh, field safety plans or requirements for field safety plans. So the National Science Foundation is currently experimenting with, they're doing a pilot plan for folks in the biological and geological sciences. They now need to submit a field safety plan along with their proposal to the National Science Foundation. Uh, the Advanced Geo Partnership gives you uh, resources and conducts workshops that will help you create your own field safety plan if you're interested. The Ecological Society of America and um, has, uh, you know, different outreach, right, that gives information about field safety plans. And then this was, this is one uh, sort of grassroots organization that has done a lot of really great work called Field Inclusive that has some other great resources. I Googled, my Googling failed. I did not find anything specific to Europe, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So um, I'm sure that there are things out here. And for me, right, like I do this with my students at the beginning of the summer, and then I have to throw in things like fire and sunscreen, right? They think of the 
you know, so like the interpersonal things. And then I have to remind them to be aware of lightning, you know, so, you know, you can do this as a co-produced document even. Uh, there are lots of great resources that have been published. Uh, my colleagues uh, published this in PLOS a few years ago, 10 simple rules for building an anti-racist lab, right? And this is really just about like being intentional, right? And uh, thinking about who you work with, um, thinking about what you study, right? And how you communicate what you study. How is it contextualized? I'm talking to a group of people who are already contextualizing their work within human impact. So I know that you already recognize the importance of making your work important to the public, right? And so we need to do the same thing, but recognize that um, we need to make it important to all, all people, right? Not just, um, in, in my case, my white colleagues. Here are different ways that we can address language barriers, right? There's funding options, journals, right? If you have uh, students who are starting with you who have English as a second language, acknowledge that that is really challenging and almost all of you do, right? So, I mean, kudos to you. I don't know how you do it, but right? Acknowledging that this time and place and maybe giving folks a space where they can work on these, um, these, these challenges together, right? Whether it's journal club or peer review of each other's papers, things like that. Particip participate in mentoring programs, right? We find that folks who can identify same gender mentors are far more likely to persist in these geosciences than um, those who do not have it. And you can see this is from a study I was part of that once our undergraduate level uh, students identified three or more female role models, they had higher than a 75% chance of staying in this field post-graduation, right? And they don't even need to know these role models. This is just identifying them, right? So it could be, you know, um, Sylvia Earle, right? A famous oceanographer, right? We can create codes of conduct, you know, the European uh, Geophysical Union has one. Uh, the American Geophysical Union also has one. And uh, they are the only society globally that I know of that has done this. They have reclassified discrimination, harassment, and bullying as scientific misconduct. And as far as I know, they're the only scientific society to do this. And I think this is critical because it is putting these behaviors on the same platform as plagiarism, as data falsification, right? It's saying these things hurt the acquisition of knowledge. They hurt our production of knowledge for society. And I think that that's a really important message. Similarly, we need to share our research in accessible ways, right? So we need to think about data management plans and we can do that um, both in our own labs and across um, our sites. And so with that, um, I just ask that you uh, reflect a little bit and think about something that you personally can do within the next two weeks. Um, you don't have to give me your answer um, to uh, really make the space that you inhabit a little bit better for someone who maybe doesn't share the same background as you. So with that, I think I haven't gone too far over time and maybe there's time for questions.